Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you that are joining us from different time zones. And welcome to a high-flying experience that's just about to take off from the flight deck live, a workshop tailored just for our general aviation pilots. I'm Jamal Wilson, and I'm thrilled to be your moderator through this exciting event featuring four incredible panels today. We've rolled out the welcome mat for general aviation pilots, whether you're a seasoned pro or you've been away from the flight deck for a while. We've crafted this workshop with one goal in mind, to make sure you're ready to soar through the skies as the cooler months beckon. Our workshop panels are here to guide you through vital aspects of surface safety and operational procedures. We want you to feel confident, avoid errors on the airfield, and ultimately reduce the potential for accidents. In the flight deck, we'll be diving deep into discussions with seasoned pilots and air traffic experts. They'll share their wisdom on case studies and safety data points, airport operations and advisory circulars, weather reports and runway conditions, aircraft safety and FAA research, and much, much more. Now, if you're here to earn those valuable wings credits today, make sure you've got your seat reserved via the Zoom link and password provided. As for the rest of our participants, you can catch all the action via the YouTube live stream link. Everyone participating via Zoom is welcome to ask questions of the panelists by using the Q&A feature in Zoom. And those on YouTube can submit your questions via the live chat. After every panel discussion, we will pick out some questions from you for the panelists to answer. All right, everyone, fasten your seatbelts because we're just about ready for takeoff here. First up, we have a panel reviewing the data on GA operations and runway events in the winter. To kickstart this incredible journey, please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel of Panel One panelists. Joining us first is Scott Proudfoot. Scott is the FAA's Headquarters Runway Safety Team Manager, and he's been an air traffic controller for 30 years with the FAA in the Baltimore, Washington, DC area. Scott moved to headquarters in 2020, to work in the runway safety office. His passion is looking into mitigations to reduce surface safety risk at our nation's airports. Scott, good to have you here. Thank you, Jamal, good to be here. Next with us today, we have Bridget Sangratanical. Bridget is an air traffic controller at DFW Tower and is NATCA National Runway Safety Representative. Bridget is the industry co-lead to the runway safety Council, which leads government and industry efforts in understanding causes of runway incursions and develop strategies to mitigate serious surface events through implementation of a data-driven, risk-based, integrated systems approach. Bridget also holds a commercial multi-engine pilot's license. Bridget, welcome. Thank you, Jamal. And our third panelist is Melanie View. Melanie is a charter captain flying a vision jet for open air based in both Gaithersburg, Maryland and Driggs, Ohio. She is also the fl chief flight instructor for open air, which is a Cirrus training center and has been flying Cirrus aircraft for eight years. Melanie is co-chair of NBAA's part 135 subcommittee, working on initiatives that better connect part 135 operators with one another and the greater business aviation network in an effort to improve safety, and the overall betterment of the industry. Melanie, welcome. Thanks, Jamal. Now, before we hear from our panel, let's take a look at a video on winter weather challenges. Failure to properly prepare for and execute appropriate cold weather airport operations has led to runway incursions, resulting in collisions with snow removal or maintenance operators and serious runway excursion accidents. This video will help set the stage for today's discussion and shed light on how you can better navigate complex taxiway and runway configurations ahead of actual flight operations. With the onset of winter weather, additional concerns and issues need to be addressed. While weather is an extremely broad subject, this video will focus on airport surface operations during winter weather. Failure to properly prepare for and execute appropriate cold weather airport operations has led to runway incursions resulting in collisions with snow removal or maintenance operators. 
and serious runway excursion accidents. Hazardous airport surface incidents during winter weather operations continue to occur. It is the responsibility of every pilot to know their own limitations and the capabilities of their particular aircraft. Before venturing off into the unforgiving winter environment, fully consider and know that you and your aircraft are prepared for and approved for the conditions that you expect to encounter. And remember, as pilot in command, you can always choose to plan your flight for more favorable conditions. During cold weather operations, surface contamination can present a serious hazard to aircraft. An iced over taxiway and a strong wind can easily move a general aviation aircraft in a direction other than the direction the pilot intended. Snow drifts can obscure signage and markings both on the surface and alongside the runway or taxiway, making it difficult for the pilot to know where to hold short or turn. Several systems are in place to help pilots better understand the surface conditions at their airport and how they may affect aircraft performance. Field conditions or FICON NOTAMs are used to describe braking action on specific runways and surfaces. Pilots subjectively assess the braking action quality of a runway surface and advise air traffic control. Braking action is described as good, good to medium, medium, medium to poor, poor, or nil. Note that airports will not report nil conditions. Rather, they will close the affected surface until conditions improve. A more objective way of describing surface conditions in FICON NOTAMs is through the use of TALPA and ARCAM. The Takeoff and Landing Performance Assessment, or TALPA, provides airports with a method to accurately and consistently determine runway conditions when the pavement is not dry. Airports use TALPA to assess, then report runway conditions in FICON NOTAM. The Runway Condition Assessment Matrix is used at airports that employ TALPA and provides objective assessments of field conditions describing contaminant type and depth. These numerical runway condition codes, encoded in a FICON NOTAM as Runway CC, also correlate with pilot braking condition descriptors referred to earlier in this video. Runway condition codes are reported for each third of a runway. ATC will provide service condition information received from pilots or airport management in qualitative or runway condition code terms. Pilots should also advise ATC if the current conditions they are experiencing are different than those reported in FICON NOTAM, and if faced with conflicting reports, consider or expect the more conservative or limiting condition. Runway condition codes are only good for the reported runway. Other surface areas may have different conditions. Now that you have the surface condition information at your airport, here are some tips and techniques to help you safely navigate the surface during winter weather. In general, plan for additional time. Arrive at your departure airport early. Winter weather conditions can change rapidly. Be flexible. Be prepared for the cold and wet environment. Think through the things that you must do differently from normal operations. All of those human factor issues that lead pilots to make surface errors are multiplied during harsh winter weather. In addition to the normal aircraft pre-flight inspections, ensure that there is no ice or contaminants on brakes, in wheel fairings, or landing gear wheel wells. Remember that other airport users may have difficulty seeing you. Use appropriate external lighting to make your aircraft more visible and give other users extra space. Know how contaminated surfaces affect your aircraft's flight characteristics and performance. Consult your airplane's pilot operating handbook. Ensure that you have the most up-to-date FICON NOTAM. Know how to interpret them and apply them to your aeronautical decision making. Active runways change frequently during snow events. Actively listen to ATIS and ATC instructions to ensure that you have the latest information. When taxiing, slow down. 
leave extra room between you and other aircraft. Not just because you may have reduced brake effectiveness, but also to minimize contaminants being blown on your aircraft by prop wash or jet blast. Airfield signs and markings may be obscured. If the runway hold short lines are covered, stop prior to the white on red runway holding position sign or runway guard lights if installed. Always use your airport diagram or moving map display throughout ground operation. At non-towered airports, share important and timely information with airborne or ground operators on the common traffic advisory frequency. If you're having difficulty seeing the airport markings, you can increase the intensity of airfield lighting by clicking your microphone on the same frequency. At towered airports, controllers will adjust lighting upon pilot request. Moreover, if you're ever in doubt as to your clearance or location on the airport, ask the tower. They're there to help. Remember, if you cannot comply with or need more time to safely execute a particular instruction, such as to expedite a takeoff or exit the runway at a specific location, do not hesitate to advise the tower unable. We hope this short video helps you safely and comfortably fly during the winter weather season. It's always better to know before you go. All right, that was an excellent video, and I believe our panel one panelists have a presentation. Uh, Scott and Bridget, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jamal. Well, Scott, like, let's go ahead and dig right on in then. So first, what we're going to do is actually, we're just kind of level setting. Basically, what is a runway incursion? So a runway incursion is the increment incorrect presence of an aircraft, vehicle, or person on the protected area of a surface designated for the landing or takeoff of an aircraft. So let's go ahead and look at our next slide, which has a little bit of what an air, the airfield movement area is. So airfield, airfield movement area, really what that is, is your taxiways and your runways. So as a pilot operating on the airfield, that has air traffic control services, you have to have a clearance by air traffic control to go in movement areas, which is, i.e. your taxiways and your runways. This diagram that you're looking at here, what it really shows is an example of your runway safety area and the protected areas around the runway. And you can see that highlighted in the color red. An example, Another example would be if you don't have a clearance to enter that red area, then what did you really just have? You had a runway incursion. So that goes back to the definition. In other words, an incorrect aircraft vehicle or person on the protected area of a surface designated for landing or takeoff. And that would be your protected area, your runway. So in other words, if you enter that area without clearance by air traffic control, then you had a runway incursion. And while this really seems very simplistic, and I, I realize this, the number one reason for a runway incursion in the national airspace system is simply a pilot crossing that hold short line without authorization. So let's go ahead and look at some high level data. All right, so what you're seeing here is five years worth of data. You can see the total number of runway incursions, and that's going to be there in the blue boxes, okay? The total number of takeoff and landings is that blue line. And then the runway incursion per million operations is in the orange line. So if you look at fiscal year 2022, so we're always looking at fiscal years when we're looking at these, there's about 52.3 million operations. So that's indicative of that line right there. 
That's 52.3 million times that we had departures or arrivals at airports with an open air traffic control tower. So in other words, the data, there isn't, all this data is around open, open air traffic control towers. If the airport is closed, like there's no air traffic services, so the tower is closed, or there's no, it's a non-towered airport, then th this data doesn't correspond to that. This is only data relative to open air traffic control towers. So for fiscal year 2022, out of the 52.3 million times somebody to an open air traffic control tower uh, facility, there were 1,730 runway incursions total. And then if you look at fiscal year 2023, if you will see in terms of the total number of takeoff and landings in the national airspace system that we're actually, up. so we're up about, my math's not great, but about 2.2 million takeoff and landings. So, and the, no, the total number of runway incursions was increased by 26. So Scott, do you have any more to add here? Would you like to go into the different severities of runway incursions? Sure. So, when we talk about runway incursions, we classify runway incursions into different categories, and it's all based off of risk. How much risk was associated with a specific event? We start at the lowest amount of possible risk, which is a category D runway incursion. So to, to describe what a category D runway incursion is, I'll start with an example. Let's say you're a aircraft holding short of a runway and you accidentally cross the hold short line, as Bridget explained, was the number one cause of runway incursions. When you cross that hold short line, if there were no other aircraft involved, no risk of collision, you were the only one that got onto that surface area without a um, clearance or authorization from ATC, that's a category D runway incursion. It starts going up the alphabet as you get higher in risk. So a category C will involve a second party. A Category C event involves another aircraft, vehicle, or a pedestrian. An aircraft, if they're within a mile final of landing on that runway, or they are operating on that runway, and you have an ample distance to avoid a collision, we're going to write that as a Category C event. <clears throat> if the aircraft on final was sent around prior to the threshold or performs a go-around from the pilot's perspective, and there was ample time to avoid any type of collision, no overflying of any aircraft occurred, that's normally your category C event. When you get into the higher risk category B event, you're looking at a, an event where you had a significant potential for collision. So now we take it into account of what type of actions did a pilot or a controller perform to prevent that collision? Was there severe braking from the aircraft? Were there um, excessive maneuvers that the pilot took to avoid the collision? How close did the two parties get together? Normally, anything greater than 300 feet or more in between that and about 2,000, um, 3,000 feet is going to be rated as a Category B event. Your Category A is where you barely avoid a collision. And now we're down to hundreds of feet. Anything less than 100 feet is going to be rated as a Category A event. So that's how our runway incursions are rated. And when you break them up, like Bridget said, you have 54.5 million operations in fiscal year 23. 1,756 runway incursions. 61% of those are related to pilot um, attributes attributed to pilot deviations. So some action on the pilot incurred on a runway. 19% are controller initiated. Some action from a controller led a pilot into a runway incursion. A vehicle pedestrian deviation, an action of a vehicle driver or a pedestrian got onto a movement area without authorization. And then 2% are in the other category. And that's kind of what we're talking about today, those others where if a surface is covered with snow and ice and you come up on the approach or the whole short line 
and you cross that line without a clearance, maybe you slid on the ice or didn't see the whole line because it was obscured by snow or some type of um, contaminant on the surface, we would classify those as others. If you had a mechanical failure, that would also be classified as another. We then get into wrong surface operations. So a wrong surface operation is defined as any aircraft that lands, departs, or attempts to land or depart from a surface other than cleared. It also includes wrong airports. In FY23, we saw 498 wrong surface operations. 439 of those were arrivals or attempted arrivals. 59 of those were departures or attempted departures. When you break down the arrival side, you had 80 arrivals that actually touched the wrong surface. 359 attempted to land on the incorrect surface, but were mitigated prior to touching the surface. Either the controller sent the pilot around, the controller re-cleared the pilot to land on the correct on, on the surface that the pilot was incorrectly lined up for, or the pilot recognized the mistake and performed a go around on their own. For the departure side, we had 23 departures that actually departed from the wrong surface. Again, this includes wrong airport. It could include a taxiway. It could include a wrong direction departure on a runway. 36 of those were attempted to depart, but were corrected prior to becoming airborne. So just to make this a little fun and a little interactive, we want to pose a question to the audience here. And we want to show you this picture. I'll, we want you to picture yourself in the cockpit of this aircraft, and we're going to enable the chat feature of this Zoom to be able to answer a question. If you were sitting in the aircraft here at this intersection and the markings that you see in front of you on the surface are what's available to you as a pilot. If ATC gave you this clearance, November 123 Alpha Bravo, runway 16 at Taxiway Golf, cleared for takeoff. Which direction do you turn onto the runway in order to depart runway 16, do you turn left or do you turn right? We want to give you just a second to enter either left or right into the chat. We always like to pose this question at our runway safety action team meetings. And while we're waiting, just a little plug for our runway safety action team meetings. If you're not involved in your local airport's runway safety action team meetings, please reach out to your FAST team representatives to get involved. It's a great way to get your voice heard, your opinions on surface safety at your local control tower at airports. All right, let's see what we're seeing. A uh, good mix of answers. We see right, we see left. There's a few, uh, unless tower yells at me, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, let's see, if you're on taxiway golf already, there's no turn is needed. You need to turn onto the runway to depart. So don't depart from taxiway golf. There is a turn needed. Uh, good answer here. Whichever turn matches your heading indicator. Excellent. We like to see pilots verify their runway heading with the compass, the heading indicator in the, in the cockpit. Uh, use all your moving maps and your tools that are um, available to you. Perfect. So the correct answer is going to be to the right. So for anybody that said left, let's clear this up right now. Runway 1634, if you put your tail to the number of the runway, when you turn onto the runway, that is the correct direction you'll be departing. Again, you want to verify that with your compass heading. But just picture this surface marking on the runway. Runway 16 numbers are over here to the left. So if you were at the full length, you would be departing from runway 16, which is down here, moving to the right. Runway 34 numbers are on the pavement marking up here, and you would be departing runway 34 to the left. Please don't depart in the wrong direction for the future. Use your compass. Use all your available tools that you have to you. Thanks for participating in the poll. I want to turn it over and introduce Melanie. She is going to have a couple of winter weather stories for you, and we'll get some uh, feedback from her.
Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or morning for those of you here on the west side of the country. Um, my name is Melanie, uh, Melanie View, uh, and I'm actually currently training a client in sunny Arizona. Uh, so it's kind of hard to believe that we're already thinking about winter ops, but I happen to know that it is snowing in my home base up in Idaho today. Uh, so really, we are already there. Um, I wanted to tell a story uh, from a personal experience that highlights some of the challenges that we can run into as general aviation pilots when it comes to flying in the wintertime. Uh, this particular story takes place on a Part 135 medevac flight um, in, a, in a jet. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's an operation that maybe some of you are familiar with, but uh, others maybe not. But I do believe that uh, a lot of the lessons learned from this, uh, this story can be applied to uh, general aviation. Uh, at the time of the story, I was not type rated on the vision jet yet. Uh, I was just about to go to training a couple weeks later. Um, but because this flight was a medevac, uh, despite being an aircraft that is typically operated single pilot, uh, we have insurance requirements that dictate that we fly with a company safety pilot, uh, specifically when we're carrying surgeons on board, along with the organs that we transport for these flights. Uh, so on this flight in January of 2022, I was acting as the safety pilot and uh, I was flying with a captain from the company. Uh, the trip started off challenging um, on, this, uh, on this flight. Um, we started off by flying to Pittsburgh to pick up three doctors uh, and the plan was to take them to Cleveland International. Uh, that's where they would perform the surgery and subsequent harvest of the donor heart. The captain and I would wait around for the three doctors to return with the heart uh, and then take them back to Pittsburgh with the organ, um, ultimately returning empty to our base in Maryland. Uh, so that first leg to Pittsburgh was uneventful, um, but the second leg to Cleveland was when things started to get interesting. Uh, we actually had to deal with an advisory cast message uh, on the flight. The issue was ultimately resolved pretty easily, but it was just the first in a series of events that further complicated the mission. So once we arrived in Cleveland, we waited a few hours for the doctors to get to the airport with the heart. Uh, but unfortunately, while we were waiting, uh, we received a message advising us that the heart was deemed unviable. So our passengers would be coming back uh, just themselves without the heart uh, and we'd be taking them home. That happens sometimes and it's always disappointing, um, but it does happen. So this is where the winter ops uh, conversation starts. By the time our passengers got to the airport, it was snowing quite heavily and it had been on and off for the time that we'd been waiting. Uh, and per our company's GOM and as common uh, general common sense would dictate on a GA flight when de-icing is not an option, uh, we are not permitted to take off with a contaminated aircraft. So ice or snow on the wings. Uh, so we told the doctors that we would have to wait for the snow to subside before we could depart. Um, we would need to wait until we could verify within five minutes of departure that the wings were clear of any snow, ice, or frost. So the snow kept up for a while. Um, after a couple hours passed, the head surgeon on the flight actually approached myself and the captain, and he said, kind of seeming frustrated at this point, he said, hey, just out of curiosity, if we had been able to take this heart with us, would we still be sitting around? Uh, and at this point, uh, it's worth mentioning that, um, especially when you're dealing with a heart, it only has a few hours before you can, uh, get it into its recipient before it's not viable anymore. So, you know, pressure is always a little bit high. Um, but, you know, we told the doctor, yeah, if we had the heart, we would still be sitting here. Uh, we can't risk the safety of five currently beating human hearts to risk, uh, one that's destined for transplant, uh, as difficult as a decision as that might be. So fortunately, this is a decision we didn't have to make uh, because we didn't have an organ, uh, it wasn't viable, but now it was getting into our heads that our passengers were starting to get irritated. Uh, so, you know, if you know the Swiss cheese model, that's kind of one of the holes, right? Uh, we've got these, this pressure from our passengers. So while we waited for the snow to stop, um, we opted to have the jet moved into hangar at the FBO uh, to melt the snow that was on the wings and to prevent any more from adhering. When the snow started to let up, we decided that if we pre-flighted, loaded our passengers, set up our FMS and avionics in the hangar, that we would be able to pull it out, get the engine started, and taxi to a nearby runway within five minutes fairly easily. And since the snow had all but stopped, we were confident that we would be able to take off uncontaminated. Problem was, as soon as we pulled the plane out, uh, the snow that had melted on the wings, of course, refroze uh, because we pulled it out into the freezing cold night. 
Um, so at this point we were, we were kind of deciding, okay, the only way that we're going to be able to take off without ice on the wings is if we get de-iced. Um, usually we try to avoid this because de-icing is a pretty expensive operation. Um, but we knew that if we didn't, uh, there was little chance that we would get our passengers home that night. And who knows for how long, uh, because snow was in the forecast for like the rest of the week. Um, and we were thinking, okay, overnight fees, hotel, food, you know, if we stick around for days, it's going to cost about the same as de-ice fluid. So, uh, so that's probably our best option. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is not an operation that we usually opt for in the vision jet. Uh, and as such, the captain, uh, I was flying with, had actually never been through the process before. Um, a little uh, sort of useful tidbit was that I was a ramp agent at United Airlines uh, in college. So I had a little experience on the other side of the de-icing process. Uh, so that was helpful, a little bit of context. Um, but we kind of decided together you know, the best way to ensure this is going to be safe is by referencing the aircraft's flight manual uh, for the procedure. So while the captain taxied, I reviewed the section of the AFM that prescribed the procedure for the de-icing. Uh, we carefully briefed the procedure with each other and briefed it with the line crew and the de-icing turned out to be uneventful and successful. Uh, as we were finally getting ready to depart, uh, we were faced with yet another challenge. Cleveland International had been alternating between using runways 24 left and 24 right. Uh, they would plow one while the other was in use, uh, and then they would switch. So at this point, uh, runway 24 right was in the process of being plowed, and 24 left is what they were using because it had already been fully plowed, uh, but it had been a while since it had its turn, so uh, it, was, it was starting to accumulate snow. Uh, so that that runway 24 left, uh, the RCAM, as you uh, learned a little bit about in that video, um, that uh, that assessment matrix for the runway condition uh, was reporting 333. Uh, and that is less than ideal. Just just as a reminder, six is dry. Zero is, you know, icy, wet slush over ice, uh, kind of the worst. So 333 is not, you know, it's not a great, great code to hear. It's, you know, that means there's been some snow on the runway. So the RCAM for uh, 24 left was uh, 333. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, for 24, yeah, for 24 left, uh, due to that snow that had accumulated in the time since it had been plowed. 24 right, however, was reporting 533. Um, it had been plowed up to that first third. So it was five, which was good. Uh, and then the last, last two thirds were threes. Uh, so we were given the option. ATC asked us, hey, which runway do you think is the most appropriate? What do you want to use here? And we actually decided on 24 left. Uh, all threes initially seemed less favorable um, than the runway that had five for its first third. But our thought process was, OK, we've had enough surprises tonight. The idea of rolling down a third of the runway that's at a five and then suddenly being hit with a you know line of snow at, at a third third of the way down runway, it, it sounded like a bad idea. Uh, so we we opted for consistency as opposed to the first third of the runway being uh, in a little bit better of, of shape. Um, so after the takeoff, uh, there were no surprises. Uh, we, we were able to take off and depart. We got our passengers home. They were tired, but they were happy to be home, uh, and we got ourselves home. So moral of the story, um, use your resources uh, and for the aircraft you're flying and for the operation that you're flying in, 135, 121, 91. Um, you know, use your flight manual, uh, use those RCAM assessment uh, codes, um, SOPs, always follow your SOPs. And uh, FAA, uh, they've got their pilot handbooks on for flight. You can use those um, and then communicate with ATC. That's kind of what would help us out a lot in this situation. Um, and of course, pass this info along. Uh, the people attending events like this a lot of times aren't the problem because uh, you guys are involved and, and learning. Um, so, you know, talk to your friends who might not be uh, watching videos like this and attending these events. Yeah, thank you very much, Melanie. I know, uh, you know, the pressure you must have felt in order to get out of there must have been really great on the on you and just uh, almost stressful. Can you just talk about real quick how you dealt with that? Yeah, um, so it's a pretty typical uh, ordeal with these medical flights, right? You know, we've got human organs. We have a limited amount of time to get them to where they need to be. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you've got multiple, multiple factors, right? Uh, usually they take place in the middle of the night. Um, so that's, that's another factor that kind of plays in. Um, but at the end of the day, if you, if you put your pilot hat on first, 
Um, you know, sometimes you kind of have to separate yourself from that operation. And, and, you know, it's like I said before, it's okay. Are you, how many, how many beating hearts are you risking for the sake of one uh, at the end of the day? Thank you. Back to you, Jamal. Appreciate it. All right, Scott, thank you. And thank the rest of the panel, Bridget and Melanie. That was extremely informative. Uh, you guys know me, we've worked together before, so you know I have some questions to ask you guys. Uh, the first one has to do, uh, in the flight deck, we tend to wrestle with ourselves on the weather front when it comes to PI reps. Uh, we ask ourselves questions like, is this worth the transmission? Is the information going to be valuable? Is it going to be used for? And sometimes we might talk ourselves out of making a PI rep. So I want to get, uh, especially Scott and Bridget and Melanie, after they answer, I'd like to incorporate your input on the flight deck side. But for Scott and Bridget, from the controller's perspective, is it important for you to receive PI reps from pilots? And do you find that information valuable? Go ahead, Bridget. I'll start. Um... <laughs> For sure. So I don't know what I don't know. So I'm that voice on the other side of the mic that you're talking to, right? And I'm sitting comfortably in an air traffic control tower. Um, like in terms of Melanie's story there, I wouldn't know what she was dealing with unless she communicated with me, right? So Pyreps, yes, I, I need to know. Turbulence, uh, icing conditions in particular, I'll highlight those two. One thing that people don't may not know is your pyreps also help meteorologists with forecasting weather as well. So we need to put that information out. So not only do the individuals who are coming behind you are also the forecast that we can put out there for information is accurate as much as it possibly can be. So I don't know unless you tell me. And what I would add to that is the difference between operating at an uncontrolled field to a controlled field at an uncontrolled field, you're talking to each other. So pilots are relaying information to other pilots as they experience conditions. At a controlled field, you're talking to the controller and the controller is responsible for issuing that information to other pilots. So receiving PIREPs is very important on the controller side because we are required to um, give that information to other pilots. So the more information that we receive to keep you up to date, is all the uh, better for us. No, that's great. And Melanie, I want to bring you in uh, because hearing that from the controllers you know, should help other pilots you know, feel more comfortable, but you on the flight deck side, uh, I want to know if you have anything you want to add to that in terms of you know the reporting of PI reps. Yeah, um, I think that uh, one of the primary resources that I use uh, on a regular basis, especially when it comes to winter ops, is pilot reports. Um, you know, when it when it comes to icing, sometimes, especially flying out in the west side of the country, uh, when uh, when uh, actual reports are few and far between, uh, it's great to get that input from other pilots via ATC. All right, excellent. So my next question has to do with when you're at the airport uh, and you have markings and signage that you could normally see if there wasn't snow on the ground or ice, uh, but in the event that the markings are obscured by snow, uh, for example, you give an order to hold short and a pilot rolls up on the taxiway and they're looking down and they can't see the whole short line. Uh, Scott, I'll start with you and then Bridget, what, what should a operator do in that instance where the markings, uh, all the important markings are obscured by ice or snow? At a controlled field, uh, first of all, report that information to the controller. Uh, we can get in touch with the airport operator to get that area cleaned up and uh, hopefully get that marking visible to you. Um, at Use all your resources that are in the cockpit. If you're using uh, electronic flight bags, uh, moving maps, uh, just keep that extra distance from that hold line to where that is showing you on your uh, diagram. And... If you have to hold a couple, uh, you know, 20, 50 feet back from the hold line to where you think it is, better safe than sorry. Well, that's, I mean, that's really about it. The more I know, the better off I can help you, right? So I, I cannot necessarily see the signage that's in front of you on the ground. Remember, I'm several hundred feet in the air, um, or I'm in a radar room if you're coming from a, a different facility. So please just advise us so we can try to contact the individuals to get out there and um, make the changes as necessary. 
And we did receive one question because I know we're running up against our time for this panel, but we did receive one question in the Q&A and it has to do with that accident that took place at Houston Hobby a couple of days ago. Uh, and it's been all over the news. And the question was what type of, or well, the classification of that accident where the one jet clipped the uh, bottom of the rudder uh, of the other accident. And I'm not quite sure that we have all the answers on this panel to answer that. But if you've seen that, uh, Bridget or Melanie or Scott, is there a classification for what that type of accident would be called? Yeah, I will tell you, uh, I'm not going to answer the question directly, but mm -hmm. accidents on the surface will fall into the category A runway incursion category. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I think that is the end of our time for this panel. So I do want to say thank you to Bridget, to Scott, and to Melanie for taking the time to educate all of our attendees on runway safety and incursions. Uh, we definitely appreciate your expertise and we thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Yeah, thank you. So what I'd like to do now is transition to our next panel of experts who will cover airport risk scenarios and visual signs, lights, and mitigation strategies for navigating airports during the winter months, especially in the presence of ice and snow. They will also discuss advisory circular 91-79 and other advisory circ circulars from the Office of Airports. So on panel two, we are joined by Matt Porter. Matt is currently the manager of the Authorized and Certificated Operations Section of AFS Air 830 Operations Group in FAA's Flight Standards Office. His team is responsible for operational policy on investigation, corporate aviation, fractional ownership operations, rotorcraft, external load operations, and agricultural aircraft ops. Matt serves as the runway safety focal point for flight standards, and he is also a current general aviation pilot and flight instructor. Matt, good to see you. Hi, uh, Jamal. Thank you. Also with us, we have Philip Davenport. Phil is an FAA Office of Airports, Airport Certification Safety Inspector. Phil has over 40 years of experience in airport management, operations, safety, and inspections spread across both the Department of Defense and FAA airfields and airports. He was one of the original charter members of the Takeoff and Landing Performance Assessment Implementation Team, that developed a runway condition assessment matrix tool that standardized runway surface condition reporting. Phil, welcome. Great evening, Jamal. And lastly, on panel two, we have Joe Costanza. Joe is a flight instructor, captain on an Airbus A320, and flies a 1941 Piper J3 Cub from his home airport in New Jersey, uh, November 14, lovingly dubbed the Flying W. Joe is active on social media and shares his love of aviation on Instagram and YouTube. Joe, it's good to have you here today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And panel two, in the same vein as panel one, I understand you have a presentation for our attendees. So I will give you the airplane. The panel is yours. Uh, next slide. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak directly to the general aviation pilot operations community. Um, the Office of Airport is responsible agency for AC 150 30 Delta, uh, which is titled the Airfield Condition Assessment and Winter Operation Safety. This AC provides guidance for airport operators to use in addressing airport surface contaminant assessments, mitigation, and reporting. It is a very comprehensive advisory circular. Uh, therefore, we don't advise uh, or advise you to have to read that entire AC to kind of understand airfield condition at an airport doing winter ops. Uh, however, we would like for you to focus on chapter five should, design, should you have the time to do so. This particular chapter covers surface assessment and reporting and can be helpful in understanding winter operation activity at an airport. This chapter gives you an idea of how airport operators will typically approach winter operations as it evolves throughout the season. Also, you'll find in this chapter the breakdown and methods of application for the runway condition assessment matrix, which is used to determine runway condition codes, which will be highlighted in a more detailed 
during panel three. And we also got some aspects of that um, RCAM in the uh, video series at the beginning of this particular symposium. The other winter operation related advisory circular is the AC 150-5200-28 golf. That is titled Notice to Air Mission Notums for Airport Operator. This particular AC has guidance on how notums are produced. For general aviation pilots, chapter three is where we would like to see you provide focus to see airport condition notums and reporting process. For those general aviation airports that use the RCAM, you'll find examples how the airport operator report contaminating conditions via notum referred to as a FICON. Next slide. As you probably are already aware, general aviation airports are different and unique across the board. Some are part 139 certificated, others are federally obligated, and there is a lot that are neither, meaning you are likely to encounter them all at some point as they exist across the national airspace system. But in this case, the uncontrolled airports are among those that give us the greatest concern, especially during winter conditions. When landing at an uncontrolled airport during the winter season, there is a potential you will likely encounter risk scenarios such as non-use of the RCAM reporting standards, lack of continuous surface assessment, delayed or no FICON reporting, uh, potential snow piles or berms caused by snow removal operation, particularly on ramps and aprons. You'll also experience variations in contaminant type and coverage at runway taxiway intersection during certain snow removal operation. And as we all know and have seen in the uh, original video, contaminants in some cases will obscure signs, marking, and lights out to the airports experience a significant snow event. So how do we combat this? So we view some strategies to mitigate, mitigate these risks that you may encounter may mean calling ahead to the airport or the FBO for information and updates on the airport condition. For airports you use on a frequent basis during the winter, consider reviewing the airport snow and ice control plan if, the, if it exists. This will give you some awareness of how the airport handles snow and ice control during those winter seasons. What we believe is a good best practice would be to couple your knowledge of the airport geometry with your moving map at those airport that you land at along with the geography in order to use other visual cues when operating on surface with obscured signs or marking after a significant snow event. Before I conclude, let me highlight two notums general aviation pilots probably will encounter more often during the winter operations than other times. Uh, general aviation pilots may encounter notums identified as condition not monitored where the term is usually appended to the last condition report for the day where an airport may go unattended, not necessarily closed, it may go unattended. So before that attendant leaves for the day, they may cite a roaming condition code or a surface condition. And at the end of that note, they may say afterwards, condition not monitored. The other one is condition not reported. The difference between the two is condition not monitored is the FICON notum, and condition not reported is an aerodrome notum. So we would recommend general aviation pilots consult the chart supplement or the airport master record for actual utilization of either notum term at an airport for dates and specific time. This information is usually reflected in the remarks section of each product. Lastly, uh, as a reminder, field condition notums have a 24 hour shelf life. In our advisory circular that both I uh, illustrated at the beginning of this presentation, uh, encourage airport operators to periodically update those FICONs to kind of show an ongoing assessment and money monitoring is taking place, even if some conditions are not changing. Uh, what that says is that you may check your notums in the morning and see a condition, even though if that condition does not change, we would like for airport operators to monitor and assess that and issue another notum to kind of show that that notum has been updated, even though the condition may be the same. So in that way, it won't appear that the notum remains stale for the entire day. 
This may or may not be the case in uncontrolled airports, usually because of limited staffing. So with that being said, I'll throw it over to my colleague, uh, Matt, to kind of discuss some of the other advisory circulars, particularly related to this particular seminar. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Good information. So uh, Phil's information is uh, really directed at airport operators, helpful to understand as a GA pilot. Um, the advisory circular that I want to share with you is uh, kind of a sister uh, advisory material to that, but it's aimed at air, uh, aircraft operators. So advisory circular uh, 9179 Bravo, uh, excited to share with you some new content from that advisory circular. It's titled the Aircraft Landing Performance and Runway Excursion Mitigation, uh, published back in August, August uh, 28th of 2023. Uh, it's a significant rewrite uh, from the uh, last version, which was alpha. There's a lot of new information. So if you haven't looked at uh, the new uh, AC9179 yet, I encourage you to do that, uh, especially as we approach the uh, cold weather season here. Um, so just an overview, the AC provides uh, ways to identify, understand, and manage the risk associated with the landing phase of flight. Um, so some things that uh, are going to be included in there to take a look at are uh, des descriptions of breaking action reports. Uh, we've already heard a lot about the RCAM, uh, so the runway condition assess assessment matrix. Uh, it also discusses the hazards associated with runway overruns and excursions. Um, one chapter is going to be about pre-departure flight planning, and then the next chapter provides uh, procedures for completing a time of arrival landing distance assessment. Um, <clears throat> the use, we'll get a little bit more into the use, but uh, generally speaking, it uh, can be used to develop SOPs, uh, training program policies, and uh, briefing guides to mitigate landing risks. Um, important thing to note would be the, uh, so the advisory circular itself is not regulatory, so Contents of the AC are just there to help you meet the regulatory requirements and operate safely. Um, and some background. So moving to some background, you see the bullet points there. Uh, we've already talked about the Talpa ARC, but um, around the time the Talpa ARC was convened by the uh, FAA, in December 2005, there's a Boeing 737 that ran off the runway at Chicago Midway. Uh, some of you or a lot of you may be familiar with that accident. The aircraft touched down normally. Uh, thrust reverser activation was delayed. And although the braking action was reported as good by the previous aircraft, the uh, NTSB analysis had in fact shown it to be poor. Uh, so the Talpa ARC was convened. Out of the Talpa ARC uh, came the ARCAM, which has also been brought up already. Uh, good summary of it there. Uh, and uh, pictorial of the op in the opening video, but um, that RCAM, so the, the TALPA standardized uh, runway condition reporting, they set the conditions within uh, the RCAM matrix that compared uh, airport observations, uh, engineering-based landing performance calculation methods, vehicle observations, and runway friction measuring ranges. Uh, so that's the book answer for you. Um, TALPA and RCAM, so they set levels of predicted aircraft wheel braking performance, but there was no guidance on uh, how actual aircraft performance could be used to provide uh, standard reports. So that kind of brings us to this AC and this new information. So in, in 2017, the Society of Aircraft Performance and Operations Engineers, SAPOE, they convened a special task group uh, to work on two ASTM standards. So the first one you can see there is 3188. Uh, and this other one is 3266. So those are a product um, of, from that organization, from that work group. And they set formalized definition minimum standards for breaking action reports uh, that are derived directly from aircraft data. So this uh, AC resolves to NTSB safety recs. There was a runway excursion in 2015 that led to uh, two safety recommendations. If you want to dig in a little bit more on those, they're Alpha 16 or Alpha 16 23 and Alpha 16 24. Uh, according to the NTSB, uh, FAA 
or I'm sorry, FA and NTSB information runway overruns during the landing phase of flight account for about 10 incidents and accidents a year, uh, some of those being fatal. So uh, let's dig in a little bit more into the, uh, the what and the how the, uh, of, of the AC. It introduces ABAR. So we have PBAR and ABAR. ABAR is aircraft breaking action reports and uh, PBAR would be pilot. Um, so breaking action reports and break, uh, breaking action and breaking action reports. Uh, it's an important concept to understand. I'll, I'll get just a little bit into those terms there. But uh, to effectively manage your landing risk, it's critical that you uh, understand uh, the effect of wheel braking, uh, and especially when you're uh, dealing with wet or contaminated surfaces. Uh, it plays a vital role in both the uh, dispatch uh, and also the TOA, time of arrival landing distance assessment. Um, these are um, commonly associated with transport category aircraft uh, and operations, but it's important to understand that these can also, uh, the, the description and information in this AC can be applied to, to really any general aviation aircraft operation uh, to a certain extent. So braking action is the term that uh, it describes the maximum capability of the vehicle's braking system on a wet or contaminated surface. Uh, PBAR, which I mentioned already, is a braking action report that results from an observation of a pilot. Whereas ABAR, the new term, is a, uh, it's a report given describing a level of braking action using data from the aircraft. So it's actually, the, the uh, aircraft itself is actually measuring the braking action. Um, uh, another important thing to understand is the reliability of breaking action reports. So if, if you're um, during pre-flight or even during flight, if you obtain a, a breaking action report, uh, it's important to know the type of aircraft and also the time of the report. Uh, the more similar the aircraft is to your aircraft and the closer it is to your actual time of arrival, the more reliable uh, that report is going to be. So how can you use all this information? Um, the, uh, the development of uh, training programs to train uh, flight crew members and to train dispatchers is the primary objective. Uh, a lot of you may be doing GA flying that uh, is not part of a larger flight department. Um, so reading through it, becoming familiar with it um, and using it during your flight training um, is really the most, most effective way to use it. Uh, creating SOPs, if you do operate uh, in a flight department, another very important way to use this information would be developing uh, standard operation procedures. And uh, lastly, this, what does this advisory circular do? It, uh, it makes our guidance in the FAA consistent with the Transport Canada. You can see the AC number 700-060 up there. So common practices and uh, for pilots that are flying between the two countries, you'll want to have consistent guidance. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, yeah, so I, uh, I currently fly an Airbus. I've been a, a captain on the Airbus for about 10 or 11 years now. And before that I was involved in GA. And for the first 10 years of my airline career, I kind of got away from general aviation and I ended up missing it uh, tremendously. So I got back into it and I, I really went, went full back into it. I bought an airplane. Um, at this point, I fly more in my Cub than I do the Airbus, uh, which, is, which is great. That's how it should be. Um, but when I came back to general aviation, it was kind of an eye opener because in the airline part 121 world, uh, pretty much everything is done for you. And as far as snow goes or if it's snowing, um, you know, yeah, as the pilot in command, as the captain, I I'm in charge, I make the final decision. But our company manuals, I mean, there's a flow chart for everything. You know, is it snowing? Yes. And then you follow this line. So a lot of those decisions are made for you. Um, so it's it's very easy uh, to not only be an Airbus captain, but remember the airplane that I'm flying is a very capable airplane, um, very powerful. I don't have to think about the cost. But like Melanie was talking about before, if there's a little bit of frost on the wing, we don't even think about it. We push back, we get sprayed with de-icing fluid. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the change that I forgot uh, between airline flying and GA. So now uh, when, when I go flying, uh, usually the preparation starts a day before. I'll go to the airport the night before, I'll install my engine blanket, 
get the preheater ready. And if I'm flying with a friend whose airplane, he, he's unfortunate enough to have a hangar, um, we'll go out the night before and we'll just throw some painter's blankets on the wing just to make sure that uh, you know, frost doesn't adhere to the wings. And if we don't have that, you know, worst case scenario, we'll park the airplane to where it'll get the most sun in the morning so that when we get there, it's, uh, we have a fighting chance. Um, but the one thing I, I did start to do when I started flying GA again is in the airlines, you know, you get to the airplane and you have your, your dispatch release and it's got all the weather, all the performance data, all the NOTAMs, it's got everything you, you could ever need. Um, that stuff is available for general, general aviation pilots, but you have to do a little bit more searching for it. So what I usually do is I'll call uh, a, a briefer, 1-800-WX-BRIEF, and I'll treat them like my own personal dispatcher. And I'll say, hey, you know, here's my plan. I'm flying from A to B uh, at this time. I looked at all the weather. This is kind of what I interpret the weather to be. Are you, see are you seeing the same thing? You, you have any advice? Is, is the weather changing? Or do you have a better route that maybe I could do? You know, any suggestions? Because all of the the METARs and the TAFs, all that stuff is great, but but I find it's it's best to just talk to a human. Um, so I use one eight hundred WX brief uh, all the time. Um, and also, if I'm flying out of a controlled airport on the way to the airport, I'll just call the tower uh, and just say, hey, you know, what are the field conditions are like? This is the weather report I got. Is it is it improving? Is it the same? Um, you know that type of thing. So, and as far as like um, having all the data for the aircraft performance and stuff. We have that stuff in the dispatch release. So all that stuff I like to do if I'm flying an airplane that requires it is I like to have all that stuff done uh, basically before I even get in the airplane. Because when I'm taxiing around, the last thing I want to do is try to be figuring out you know, the performance data and, and be heads down. Um, that's the other thing that I wasn't used to is you know, I don't have an autopilot. Uh, usually I'm flying by myself. So it's, you know, if I'm taxiing around, I want to make sure that I'm heads up you know, looking around because one thing I also learned is I thought uh, I've been around certain airports, whether it's Logan or, or Newark or LaGuardia, and I thought I knew the airport like the back of my hand. But when it snows or after it snows and they start plowing these airports, it you can get lost very quickly. The signs are blocked and you're just not used to seeing certain taxiways closed. So that that was a big change. And I advise everyone is, you know, when in doubt, chicken out, just stop the airplane, get your bearings, ask, uh, you know, if it's an, uh, obviously a control tower, ask control tower. I can't tell you how many times I stopped the airplane and said, hey, I, I think I'm in this intersection and, you know, do you want me to turn left here or right? I forget. And they're 99.9% .9 of the time, they're very thankful because that helps, uh, cre you know, create a, a runway incursion. Um, so that that was one of the things that I wasn't used to. Is sometimes you feel like you're, you're kind of on your own. And, uh, you know, I'm taxiing out now. I try to treat it like I'm in the airliner. If I'm flying with passengers, I just say, hey, you know, let's let's keep it sterile. If you need me for something, just wait till the airplane stopped and parked and maybe tap me on my shoulder or wait until, you know, we're in the air. Um, if I'm flying a twin engine airplane, I you normally would single engine taxi to save, save gas, especially at almost eight bucks a gallon in my airport. Uh, but when it's snowing or there's patchy ice, I like to taxi uh, with both engines, asymmetrical thrust that gets a little trickier. Uh, and one thing, my local airport, it's an uncontrolled field. And, and when it does snow, it's usually a landscaping company that plows it. And when they plow it, they're good at plowing what they're used to, which is roads. But sometimes they forget that airplanes have wings. So I caution people to really just look out for snow banks. I've, I've seen a lot of people clip their wingtips, um, just small things that I've noticed where you, know, you go to an airport like Newark, they're, they, they're really good at plowing. Some airports, not so much. Um, and in route, I, I, I tell people, listen, use air traffic control to maybe get a, a weather report down the line. You don't want to be preparing for your approach or running your performance numbers when you're on the approach. You want to be executing the plan that you had way back in cruise. And, you know, don't be shy to ask whether you're on with center or maybe you can get in line or get on line with an approach down the road and just kind of get a weather report of what's going on. And if it's an uncontrolled field, just listen to the CTAF or just maybe ask or call into the FBO and, and just get a, a field report. Um, and they talked about it before, but high reps are the, the ultimate um, pilot, uh, pilot friendly thing because that's gonna give you the most accurate information. And you know, the first thing that we always do when I'm working at the airlines where we check in with a new center is, you know, how are the rides or can I get a, a ride report? So PIREPs are, are very, very helpful. And also be aware that PIREPs, you know, you can have an airplane on the same arrival, uh, 
just a couple miles ahead of you, go through an area of precipitation and get moderate icing and we'll be the same type of area and we won't get any icing. And the same can happen where we do get icing and the airplane behind us doesn't. So just, just be aware of that. Um, and approaching, approaching the, the airport, I tell people, you know, even if the, let's say a front blew through and, and the weather's clear in a million, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have uh, maybe an alternate airport in mind because there's been one or two times where let's say you snow is blowing through and they, they plowed it as best they could and there's some thin patchy ice and it's windy, clear in a million, but the airplane ahead of you lands and let's say they get stuck on the runway or they slide off the runway, well now that airport's no good to you. So you have to kind of execute your alternate plan to where normally you, you base your alternate on, hey, if it's the weather's clear in a million, I don't need an alternate. Um, so just make sure you always have a backup plan. And when you do land, uh, don't forget your airplane's cold soak. So when you taxi off the runway and if you go through some precipitation, maybe just wait to, to raise the flaps up to get the airplane stopped um, to make sure you don't have any ice adhering to the flight controls. Uh, just just kind of stuff like that. And as far as um, the advisory circular 91-79, Philip talked about it before a little bit. But when you get the weather reports, um, you know, try to understand where the, the breaking reports are coming from. Is it generated by a computer? Is it a person, a vehicle on the runway, or was it another pilot and an airplane? So it's important to differentiate that. And lastly, um, you know, know that a, a Airbus or a 73 landing, we have auto brakes, we have lift dumping devices like spoilers, we have uh, thrust reversers. So just understand that you know maybe medium or poor braking for us might mean something completely different to, to your airplane. So just make sure you you understand that that difference. That's all I got, gentlemen. That was an excellent presentation, and Joe, I'm sure the attendees greatly appreciate the depth and breadth of your experience talking about the commercial side and the private side and what you're looking for in both aspects. Very very well done. Greatly appreciated. In the few minutes that we have left in this panel, I do wanna ask a couple of questions and we have a couple in the Q&A. Matt, would you refresh our memories when you were talking about P-bar and A-bar, what was that AC that that was referenced in? Uh, that, that's the advisory circular 9179 Bravo. You'll, okay. you'll find a, a complete description of both uh, A-bar and P-bar in there. And then the appendix uh, actually contains um, not just a, a definition, but a good explanation of the ABAR system. Okay, thank you for that. And then, uh, Joe, specifically for you, there's a question asking about your experience for braking on a runway that looks okay. Do you have any experience that you could share with our attendees? I, I do, and it, it's funny because, um, you know, expect the unexpected. I, there's been a couple of times where I've landed and the run, you break out, you're on a, you know, eyeless approach at Atlantic City, which is my, my home base. And it, you just see nothing but white and you see the lights and you think this is, you know, this is, this may not be good, right? And you land and braking is good and it's fine. And then there's been times where the runway just looks a little wet and it's, oh, there's no snow, it looks fine. And you land and the auto brakes start to engage and the airplane's kind of all over the place. So, don't ever assume that based on what the runway looks like, uh, braking will be okay because it nine times out of 10, it's completely different than, than what you're expecting. So just always be ready for a worst case scenario is, is my best advice. And that's great advice to follow. Uh, in a little bit of time that we have left, Phil, I do have one last question for you. So you mentioned the two advisory circles that you were speaking about earlier. Uh, with as many airports as there are, especially GA airports in the NAS, are all of those GA airports required to use those two ACs that you were talking about? And Phil, if you're talking, you're muted, so. My oh, apologies. There you go, you're in the, you're in the game now. <laughs> no. Okay, uh, those general aviation airports uh, don't really have to follow those ACs. It is a way to meet standards. Our federal obligated airport, as well as our part nine certificate airport it is mandatory for those. Uh, for general aviation, it is a way that they can utilize in which most of the airports use to ensure um, to meet the uh, standards as to how uh, airport infrastructure is uh, put in place. Uh, but unfortunately, they do not, but we encourage them to do so because that is the most reliable standards that we are aware of that we deal with day to day. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that, Phil. 
Uh, with that, I believe that's all the time we have for panel two. So I do want to thank all of our panelists, Matt, Phil, Joe, for shedding light on airport risk scenarios. Uh, I'm sure our attendees will agree that your insights on AC 91-79 and the other ACs are invaluable for ensuring safety during challenging conditions. We do appreciate your expertise and your dedication to aviation safety. Thank you, gentlemen. And with that, let's delve into weather-related aspects, exploring comprehensive briefing procedures, pilot reports, or PIREPs for short, and the application of the runway condition assessment matrix. With that, please welcome to our flight deck the next group of panelists. First with us, we have Jeff Arnold. Jeff is an Oklahoma State University graduate, has held flight instructor certificates for over 15 years, previously served as an adjunct instructor at Tarrant County College's flight program and program manager for two large flight academies, and is a former flight service weather briefer and air operations manager. Jeff currently serves as the Director of Innovation and Outreach for Lidos Flight Service. Jeff, good to see you. Hey, good to see you again. Good afternoon. Next with us, we have Phil Davenport, who was a participant from our last panel. Phil, it's been so long since I've seen you. Welcome back. Hey, Jamal. <clears throat> and lastly with us, we have Brad Sipperly. Brad is an Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University graduate, go Eagles, has held flight instructor certificates for 35 years, previously served as an instructor and safety officer at three U.S. Air Force Aero Clubs as a part 135 line pilot and as a check airman for the Alaska Wing Civil Aviation or Civil Air Patrol, excuse me. Brad is a retired Air Force weather forecaster who following retirement worked for the National Weather Service for 13 years. In 2014, he joined the FAA as an operations inspector and frontline manager. Brad currently serves as an aviation safety inspector for the FAA's general aviation and commercial division and is also an active pilot and aircraft owner. Brad, thanks for being with us today. I'm happy to be here, thank you. And just like the first two panels, panel three, I understand that you have a presentation for our attendees, so I will give the aircraft to you. The airplane is yours. Okay, again, I'll start the, this panel and next slide. I'm gonna be a little repetitive here because uh, we've seen and heard uh, some ideas and uh, talk about the RCAM in the video at the beginning of this uh, symposium, but uh, being re repetitive uh, kind of reinforce the training I've been told in some cases. So um, I'm highlighting the runway condition assessment matrix here, that tool that originated from the uh, takeoff and landing performance assessment team in 2016 and is now the National Airspace System Standard for Surface Condition Assessment and Reporting. Uh, we had a collaborative effort with aircraft manufacturers, the airport industry, pilot uh, association, and other stakeholders determined that variance in contaminant type, depth, and air temperatures can cause specific changes in aircraft braking performance. At, at the core of the RCAM is the ability to differentiate among the performance characteristics of a given contaminant. There is a lot of useful information and guiding material for several lines of business that contribute to this RCAM development at the website Illustrated. I would recommend the, uh, the self-paced narrated briefing on the RCAM utilization for any first time user of this link, uh, which is again, illustrated here. There's a lot of good information there. Uh, next slide. Uh, for those that may not be um, entirely familiar with the RCAM, I'll give a, a quick overview. Uh, the unshaded portion of the RCAM is associated with how an airport operator conducts a runway condition assessment. Uh, the shaded portion of the RCAM is associated with the pilot experience with braking action. This RCAM illustration will differ from the RCAM illustration used by aircraft pilots illustrated in AC 9179, mitigating the risks of a runway overrun upon the landing. The runway condition codes represent one value for each third of the landing surface, touchdown, midpoint, and rollout. When the runway condition codes are reported, an example was given in the earlier video uh, of like, for example, 433, 
which represent the runway condition description as reported by the airport operator. And this will be depicted in the notice that was illustrated earlier and will show contaminant type, depth, and coverage for each third of the runway. Runway condition codes are disseminated via the federal NOTAM system, airport traffic control tower, flight service station, directly by the airport operators via the common traffic advisory frequency. For general aviation pilots, we encourage you to be more vigilant at uncontrolled airports. Can I go to the next slide, please? In the uncontrolled airport environment, the process of airport condition assessment, mitigation, and reporting will likely be different, perhaps based on staff and availability at the airport. We refer to a lot of these airport uncontrolled airports as the mom and pop type operation. When operation activities on the airport is likely coordinated and communicated via UNICOM, CTAF frequency, or airport advisory frequency. And more than likely, um, which we will offer a caution, no one office or individual are monitoring all of them simultaneously. Just another note to counter uh, related to the RCAN, uh, the day-to-day -day wet surface contaminant reporting alone is not mandatory for airports, but it is highly encouraged. However, during the winter months season, wet is reported because it's likely to be coupled with other winter contaminants. Therefore, you can expect to see more wet contaminant reporting in the NOTAM system during the winter season. Airport operators must report wet conditions when associated with or as a result of winter contaminants when present in any third of the runway. Additionally, when a runway has been treated with chemicals to mitigate the Pacific contaminant and the resulting surface is now wet, this condition will also be reported as wet. So the understanding of the RCAM mean general aviation pilots do not report a runway condition code value uh, zero through six. Instead, pilots will use one of the six reporting description when power reps are solicited by air traffic control or offered otherwise. And as illustrated again in the early video, those descriptions are good, good to medium, medium, medium to poor, poor and nil. You will never see nil reported in the NOTAM system, the airport or that particular runway bill will be closed if there is a nil uh, assessment that's been uh, determined. Also, please keep in mind pilot reports, which provide a valuable information, but they are rarely applied to the full length of the runway. As such, these reports are often limited to a specific section of the runway surface in which wheel breaking action was applied. And lastly, uh, we would, if you should have the opportunity, please uh, access our short video on preparing for airport one operation as part of the flight deck series that we developed some time ago, a couple of years back. Uh, we believe there's some useful information in this that will be helpful for preparing for one operation in an airport. So with that said, I'll throw it over to my colleague, Brad. All right, well, next slide then, please. I can jump in on these if we want to switch Actually, up order. There you go. It's your turn now, Jeff. No problem. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Arnold, and uh, I, I want to go through these uh, through these slides with you. But before I do, I want to share some of these weather facts. And and in a study conducted by Embry Riddle, and and you can find that study at the link uh, below. Uh, pilots scored below 70% on weather knowledge and weather hazard product interpretation. The pilots that they uh, uh, interviewed were private instrument and commercial and student pilots uh, in, a, in a pretty wide survey. Uh, pilots struggled at interpreting weather along their route of flight, and they also held incorrect weather expectations in route and at their destination. So what that means is that even though they got the weather before they went and flew, uh, they either forgot about the weather that they were supposed to encounter halfway, three quarters of the way into their flight, uh, or they weren't ready or, or whatever else happened. Um, the next uh, uh, segment over here on the right, weather sentiments, these numbers come from the NTSB and from about the last 10 years of data. 
weather's associated with a quarter of all accidents and uh, be that either in, in primary or secondary contributing form. Uh, if your accident happen, happen, excuse me, when uh, IMC is a factor, uh, the chances of that accident being fatal is uh, greater than 80%. How do we define IMC in this specific context? IMC is going to be defined as nighttime, uh, clouds, low visibilities, uh, that kind of stuff, right? Anything that affects the pilot's visibility results in loss in control and usually winds up fatal. Uh, for the past decade, we've had uh, about 1,250, again, uh, fall on either side of that line, uh, plus or minus, uh, about 1,200 accidents a year. And 225, 250 of those are fatal. And, and again, that is a recurring trend over the last decade. Uh, so with that in mind, we've got November and December left of this year. And, um, and I hate to say this, but we've got about 200 to go and we're well on our way of, of meeting that number, unfortunately. Um, a little bit about what I do. I, I help uh, flight service uh, uh, in several ways, outreach, uh, innovation, and uh, one of the things that I get to do is go around and talk to groups of pilots, EAA chapters, flight schools, you name it. Uh, the first thing I'll ask them is, how many of you are comfortable with weather? And uh, maybe 20% of the room will raise their hand. And we see that as a problem. Uh, we see that as a problem because we, uh, we have pilots self-identifying as being uncomfortable with a critical uh, knowledge and subject area. Uh, and, and as well, I'll, th I'll throw this in there. It is, in theory, possible to miss every single weather question on the pilot written test and still conceivably pass the test. Uh, now, you'd have to be pretty spot on with the other subject areas, but it is possible. I wanted to throw this last thing in, in here uh, below because I couldn't find anywhere else to put it in the presentation. But these are some of the terms that I've heard over the years, uh, whether I'm in an FEO or at a flight school or, uh, you know, uh, doing chart or whatever. Uh, if things get worse, I can turn around. Uh, I'm a VFR only pilot. If I can't go VFR, I'm not going. I can't tell you how many people have said that, uh, but still wound up in the NTSB statistics. Uh, we'll figure it out when we get up there. And then my personal favorite, and, and I, I was kind of reminded of the medevac story we heard er earlier, and I'm really glad to hear that uh, uh, that was a great outcome for you guys uh, because you... Uh, you really took took your time and slowed down and thought through the process and said, uh, you know, what are my risks here and what are the possible impacts? But my favorite is, you can check the weather, but we're still going. And and that phrase has frustrated me for uh, two decades. Um, so we talk about how do you increase your comfort with weather? Uh, and this is pretty straightforward, but I recommend to all pilots, uh, learn the weather. Uh, we're here. Flight service is here. Our phones are on 24 7 365. If you have a question about whether we will answer it, we'll talk it out, we'll get you figured out, we'll get you set up and squared away. Uh, but we strongly advocate that pilots take a, weather, a look at the weather first before they call. And the reason why is because we want you to come to this briefing as an equally invested partner in the briefing. How many times have you rolled out of bed, called for a briefing, and you had a weather briefer, uh, you know, firing weather at you at 40 miles an hour? Uh, you know, maybe you picked up 20 or 30 percent of that. Uh, when you take a look through everything and then call, not only can we uh, address specific questions and concerns, but now when the briefers are giving you weather information, you have something in your brain to tie it to. Uh, so I recommend all pilots uh, practice daily, every other day, whatever you can manage. Make a five-minute dry run at, at uh, briefing yourself. And at the end of it, I want you to do two things. Uh, I want you to make a go and no-go decision, and then I want you to go back later in the day and see how it would have worked out for yourself. You'll be surprised what you'd learn. Make sure that you're tying your briefings to a process, so make sure that you're using a, a self-briefing checklist. Uh, we use checklists for everything. Uh, briefings should be no different. Uh, you have a lot of resources available at your disposal beyond the internet. Uh, your flight instructor, your flight school, uh, flying community and clubs, use them. Um, and then proficiency, as, as you are all well aware, flying is a very perishable skill, and so is weather knowledge and interpretation. Uh, sometimes it takes a few minutes to knock the rust off. But as always, if you're ever in doubt about, uh, you know, hey, if I'm thinking about, uh, you know, whether or not we should go, this go, no go decision this hard, uh, then maybe we shouldn't go. And that's a rule that I've always tried to follow. If I'm thinking about it this hard, then maybe I need to sit this one out. As an extension, and this is very similar to what we just talked about, so I won't go through this uh, uh, all the way, but 
I get asked quite a bit, how do I teach my students to be comfortable with weather from day one? And, and uh, I, I want to kind of qualify that by saying, I have taught a lot of students how to fly. I'll tell you right now, as a flight instructor, weather was my uh, worst subject uh, for most of the career that I was a flight instructor, right? I didn't really learn weather until I went to the Flight Service Academy, which isn't an option for a lot of people. We get that. Um, but all that being said, I, in other words, what I'm trying to say is I trained a lot of students to be very poor in weather as well because my skills weren't where they needed to be. And so what I'm saying with this slide is we have to stop that buck somewhere. We have to stop that descent. Uh, so how do you teach your students to be comfortable with weather? Teach it just like a pre-flight. Uh, walk them through it. Do it. Uh, you know, have them ask questions throughout the briefing. Uh, let them know where the resources are. Uh, let them know where the checklists are. Uh, demonstrate. Uh, after that, take a few steps back, observe and evaluate, you know, provide input where you can, and eventually you're going to want to take the training wheels off and say, hey, you know the process when you have questions, and you will, uh, you know, let me know and we can get those figured out together. Um, but the biggest thing that I want to say today is make sure that you're insisting on consistency with your students. Just one skipped pre-flight briefing sends a message that this is okay. And I'll never forget sitting around a flight instructor, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, an FBO table and hearing a couple of flight instructors talking about going on a flight. And one of them said, hey, did anyone check the weather? And somebody said, eh, we'll figure it out when we get up there. And as a student, I remember thinking, and you all know how students view instructors. Uh, they know everything, right? I remember as a student thinking, oh, so this is how the world really works. And it took a long time for that law of primacy to get erased for me. Um, to kind of wrap this up, uh, I've got two more slides for you. Uh, there are three types of briefings, and we've discovered lately that maybe uh, a lot of pilots aren't aware of this. So I wanted to throw it in here. Uh, three types of briefings, a standard, an abbreviated, and an outlook. A standard means, uh, I, and I really enjoy saying this because it sounds funny, but I have nothing and I need everything. Uh, that's what you're saying when you request a standard weather briefing. And abbreviated means, hey, I've looked at the weather uh, or I have some of the weather and I either need to fill in the blanks or I have questions. And the outlook briefing is used for departures uh, in excess of six hours in the future. Um, to wrap this up, uh, I, I included a, a screenshot from our website, uh, 1-800-WXBrief.com. And you'll notice you can really customize, drill down and customize these briefings. You can uh, uh, really cherry pick whichever uh, weather products you'd like. Uh, we've tried to do our best with NOTAM filtering to try and cut down on the length of those briefings, but uh, you know, there's only so much we can do. And then again, we offer uh, uh, briefings and, and a multitude of delivery methods. Uh, I usually take email up, but uh, you know, PDF is, I think, our, our most popular. Uh, to wrap this uh, this last piece up, I'm sorry, I know I said that a slide ago. I forgot about this one. Um, I put some tips down uh, that I thought were really funny at about two in the morning when I made these slides. So I'll run uh, through these and, and let's have some fun. Uh, so how do you learn weather? And remember, I told you to practice five minutes a day. Think about uh, the return on investment you're going to get after a year of investing in yourself for five minutes a day. And that's exactly what you're doing. But admit what you don't know and attack it with education. And, and that's one size fits all advice. Uh, draw a weather timeline when you're looking at the weather, you know, uh, departure, destination, and then just start filling in all the things on that timeline that you're going to encounter so that you don't forget about them and you remember them as you're flying along. Uh, remember Jeff's uh, uh, super fancy an official icing formula, which is clouds plus winter equals icing. Uh, that's that's I'm being a little funny with that. Uh, there's also two types of icing, according to Jeff Arnold. There's known and well, you probably should have known, right? Um, lastly, learn how to effectively utilize radar and satellite imagery. Again, radar is looking at weather from below, satellites looking at it from above to give you that complete picture. Uh, those two uh, products really complement each other, and if you can get your hands on some formal training for it, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, the last bullet point that I have, I promise, uh, try not to rely solely on METARs and TAFs for a weather briefing. And the reason why is, uh, I, I'll never forget, I opened the aviation forecast discussion, opened it up for my area, and it said, uh, uh, convective activity is an almost certainty, but we left it out of the TAF until we can nail down the time period. And all the METARs and TAFs are showing clear skies and limited visibilities for the rest of the day. 
so again, say that to say uh, you could be missing something if you're only relying on METARs and TAFs. Uh, with that, I will uh, hand it over to Brad, and uh, that's all for me. Thanks, Jeff. Are you sure you're done? No, just kidding. Well, hello, everybody from Fairbanks, Alaska, where, as you can imagine, winter is already here. There's been a lot of talk already about pilot reports. I'm just going to add a little bit more to that uh, here, and I'm going to focus mainly on icing uh, reports. Uh, so icing forecasts, of course, display potential over a large area, while the pilot reports are what's happening at a specific time and location. It's important to keep in mind that only pilots, so that's you, can directly observe and report icing, providing the fellow pilots and weather forecasters vital information they need for flight planning and forecast validation. Uh, this vital information listed on this slide is made available only by you, the pilot, including the location and altitude of icing or no icing, which is just as important, uh, the severity and type of icing that you are encountering, encountering the cloud bases and tops, and the temperatures aloft. And I'll also add in there, it's important, uh, your aircraft type is also important. Uh, next slide, please. Just a quick refresher on the basic types of icing. Uh, clear icing is that uh, clear or translucent ice that is formed by the relative slow freezing of large supercooled water drops, while mixed icing has that simultaneous appearance of both a rime and clear ice, or an ice formation that has the characteristics of both rime and clear icing. And then rime ice is that rough, white, milky, opaque ice that's formed by the instantaneous freezing of small supercooled water droplets. Uh, it's generally rougher in appearance than clear ice. Uh, and again, keep in mind that a report of no icing is just as useful as reports of icing. Uh, next slide, please. So icing severity, uh, to standardize the reports of the severity of icing encountered, the FAA has uh, defined the four levels of icing severity from trace to severe. It's important to, to keep in mind that the type of aircraft and the length of exposure has a lot to do with the uh, severity of icing that is experienced. Uh, for example, trace icing is when icing first becomes noticeable. The rate of accumulation is defined as less than one quarter of inch, uh, sorry, one quarter inch per hour on the outer wing, where on the other end of the spectrum, severe icing is uh, defined as the rate of accumulation of a quarter inch of ice in less than five minutes. In fact, it's so fast that <clears throat> ice protection systems uh, often fail to remove an, the accumulation of ice, and severe icing is usually a product of clear or mixed icing encounter. Um, Again, keep in mind that the severity uh, depends on the aircraft type and speed. Uh, for example, a single uh, piston versus a twin turbine uh, climbing through the same area. The speed at which each travels in the climb determines their exposure uh, to the conditions and the amount of accretion they would experience. So, uh, for example, the light uh, single may uh, report a moderate icing in an area while uh, in a climb through an area while a uh, twin turbine climbing much faster may only report that as uh, light icing. So it's uh, good to look at the type of aircraft that's uh, filing a powder report to get a better idea. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think you skipped one there. Can you go back one? Okay, there we go. Icing severity. Um, thank you. So yeah, so icing severity. Uh, Again, we've already talked about this. So go next slide. We thought we missed one. Well, okay, I thought we missed one. All right, well, where to get pilot reports? There's several sources where you can get uh, pilot reports, um, including the Aviation Weather Center site, as you can see here. You can also go to um, um, ForeFlight or several other weather apps that uh, will provide you pilot reports. The nice thing about this one, the Aviation Weather Center, you can actually uh, find a pilot report symbol and mouse over it, and it'll give you the graphic uh, display where it decodes it for you, which makes it very easy for you to read the information. Uh, next slide, please. So the severity symbols that are associated with icing are uh, color-coded basically for you, uh, green being uh, the uh, 
trace icing all the way up to severe, which is coded in red. And of course, they add lines for severity as well. And in this instance, uh, again, the automation is great. If you have that available where you can just do a mouse over it and it'll decode the pilot report for you. You can see in this case, it's decoded the severity for you as moderate and it's given you the associated type that was reported as rhyme. Uh, next slide, please. So talked about where to get pilot reports. There's uh, to file pilot reports. Of course, you can go to flight service, uh, air traffic, or you can register online uh, via the Aviation Weather Center website. If you go to the tools section there, you can find a place where you can register to uh, do those online. Uh, as an aid, there is a pilot form you can find in the chart supplement along with encoding procedures. Uh, but keep in mind that all pirates Pirates have value. So even if you don't have all that information, you know, on a pirate form, a report would you feel is important. If, you, if you're just going through an area of icing and that's, that's you know, you just want to give that report, uh, you know, just go ahead and give that. Uh, if you have all the information, great. You know, the more information, the better. We'll take it. Uh, and next slide, please. And uh, as far as reference materials, there's a lot of places you can go to uh, find information on icing conditions and pilot reports, including a AC 9174 Bravo. Um, NASA has a really good pilot's guide to in-flight icing. I included the URL there. Uh, that's a good one to go to. And uh, there's other resources here too. The FAA Safety Magazine is also a good location to go to find information. So uh, that's it, quick and simple. We've had a lot of other comments and uh, discussion on pilot reports. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to touch on today. Thank you. No, thank you, Brad. And for the rest of the panelists, thank you also. Uh, in particular, uh, Brad, you brought up a point that was actually asked by an attendee in a previous panel where they were curious where PIREP information ended up. And you basically showed us a couple of slides ago, slides ago exactly where you can go get that. So uh, thank you for that, not only for your presentation in this panel, but answering a question from a previous panel that will help that attendee and I'm sure others to be able to go find PIREP information uh, to look at themselves. Uh, also, Jeff, you brought up an interesting point that really tracks back to one of the most basic human factors um, kind of rules where people see and hear what they expect to see and hear. So when you're talking about your weather data, how folks interpolate you know, weather data, you really have to remind yourself as a pilot to be objective when you're looking at these things. If you're looking at that data because you want it to match what your proposed operation is, you can fly in anything. Yep, I can make it. This looks good. Look at the weather for what it is. Be honest about what that information is telling you and think about safety as opposed to letting get their itis or any of the other human factors hiccups get you in trouble. With that, Jeff, I don't know if you had anything to say to, to close that out. Just two quick sentences. Uh, confirmation bias is real, and uh, I forgot the second sentence, but uh, it was relevant. I promise. No, you're you're a hundred percent correct. Oh, there it is. Uh, one thing I want everyone to think about is uh, don't forget the difference between uh, expected, assumed, uh, reality, and actual. I'll leave you with that. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And with that, I would like to thank all of our panel three panelists for delving into those crucial aspects of weather briefing, the significance of PI reps on weather conditions, and the utility of the runway condition assessment matrix. Your insights, just like the other panelists, have been instrumental in enhancing aviation safety and preparedness. I and the rest of the panelists and the attendees are grateful for your expertise and your dedication to the aviation industry. Thank you, gentlemen. And with that, we will transition to our last panel for the afternoon. Our last panel is here to talk about ice buildup, its impacts at different altitudes, and winter survival techniques for emergency situations. They'll also review best practices for putting an aircraft to bed during the winter months, as well as updates on FAA icing research. Please welcome Brad Siverly, who was just participating in the last panel. Brad, welcome back. Thank you. Also with us, we have Stephanie DeVito. Stephanie is a research meteorologist for the FAA, working in the aircraft icing research program and supports a variety of icing and weather research. 
of particular interest to general aviation. She manages a project developing a tool to identify and forecast different supercooled liquid water icing environments at a fine scale within terminal areas. Stephanie, it's great to have you with us today. Hi, thank you. And also in panel four, we have Mike Millard. Mike is an aviation safety inspector in the general aviation and commercial operations branch at the FAA. He retired from the Air Force after 21 years in aircraft maintenance and moved to Ohio, where he taught aircraft maintenance at an FAR Part 147 aircraft maintenance technician school before joining the FAA. His civilian aviation background includes being an A&P, an IA, a DME, a senior parachute rigger, and a pilot. Mike grew up in Idaho, where he spent much of his life in the great outdoors and later lived in Alaska, where he continued to learn and experience surviving in the wild. Mike, welcome. Thank you very much. All right, panelists. So in the vein of our presentation thus far, I believe panel four does have a presentation as well. So I will give the airplane to you guys now. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So um, again, I'm Stephanie DeVito. I will be covering topics on ice buildup, impacts at different altitudes, and provide some updates on ongoing FAA icing research. Next slide, please. So to start, uh, and one more click. Thanks. Uh, so to start, ice buildup is called is caused by supercooled liquid water, and supercooled liquid water is water that remains at, remains a liquid below the freezing temperature, which is a zero degree Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And when this supercooled liquid water comes into contact with a surface like your aircraft, it freezes upon contact and forms a layer of ice. Um, you heard from Brad in an earlier panel, some of the types of ice that can form and whether or not it's rime or clear or mixed will really vary depending on the environment and other factors. But for many of you, regardless of the type, ice is ice, and it can build up rapidly. So you'll want to monitor and check for spots that show early signs of the presence of icing. Um, and if you can click this slide one more time. Thank you. Um, so you can look for such indications on locations such as your wipers. If you have them, you can see that on the left image that just popped up. Um, you can also take a look at your side cockpit windows. There's some pictures in the middle showing what that might look like. Um, also around the edges of the windshield. So you'll want to look for these early signs and react accordingly because you may not otherwise notice the aerodynamic effect of ice buildup until you go to change the orientation or configuration of the aircraft. So it doesn't take a lot of ice to have a negative aerodynamic effect. So you want to keep an eye out for those things. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with that being said, when it comes to the impacts of icing at different altitudes, for the presence of supercooled liquid water, temperature matters more than altitude. So supercooled liquid water can actually exist at temperatures down to negative 40 degrees Celsius or negative 40 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And yes, those values are the same at this particular temperature. That's not a typo. Um, but if you're not protected, you'll want to stay at temperatures above freezing or at least stay near the freezing level. You'll also want to be mindful that any escape maneuver really shouldn't require significant performance, such as a rapid climb. Um, if you are descending, you might want to keep in mind that uh, you should be prepared for some uh, precipitation, which could also be freezing precipitation, like freezing drizzle or freezing rain. If your escape maneuver maybe is to ascend and maybe try to escape out of the cloud top, uh, you might want to be prepared for conditions to worsen before they get better as you approach the cloud top, because that does uh, happen in certain clouds. Um, but you also want to consider whether you can even escape the cloud above. This is where altitude becomes a larger factor uh, because the cloud top may be above the altitude you can realistically fly. So protect and even consider padding uh, your temperature, altitude, and performance margins. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I thought it might also be useful to address some common misconceptions when it comes to icing and the presence of supercooled liquid water. Uh, so icing can in fact be found year round, including in the southern states. It can be found aloft when there are warm surface temperatures. It can be found aloft when there's no precipitation being reported at the surface. It can be found aloft when snow is being reported at the surface. And in fact, 
precipitation can even be found aloft when there is no precipitation at the surface. So with such a messy environment that could exist for um, winter ops, it's important to remain vigilant and recognize that VFR only pilots do have inadvertent encounters with in-flight icing. So even if you're VFR only, it's important to know how to recognize and exit those conditions. Because keep in mind that even just being in rain or drizzle, you can um, and you can still see in it that may become or already be freezing rain or freezing drizzle. So again, it's important to know how to recognize and exit those conditions for your aircraft. I covered some suggestions on an earlier slide with respect to spotting early signs of where you might see ice starting to build up on your aircraft. But if you go to the next slide, please. There is also icing weather information out there to help you gain additional situational awareness with respect to the icing threat. Um, this is just a list of available icing products that are operationally available, and you can find these on the aviationweather.gov website. The link is there on the right. Um, but while this list is not all inclusive, it hopefully provides um, a start for you to start digging into it yourself. Next slide. And um, as far as FAA icing research goes, uh, two products listed on the previous slide were the current icing product or SIP and the forecast icing product FIP. And these are both operational products, um, but they are still undergoing enhancement. So one such enhancement is increasing the resolution as shown in the graphic here, where this image on the left uh, shows the old resolution and the image on the right shows the newer increased resolution for this tool. There are other enhancements underway, um, but if anyone wants more information about these projects, or I'm sorry, these products, um, you can contact my colleague Danny. His information is on this slide um, as he is the FAA lead for this work in particular. Next slide, please. Um, and this is where my area of research falls under right now. Um, with respect to the terminal area, I'm leading a project to develop a terminal area icing product that is intended to support flight planning and tactical decision making within the terminal area. Uh, we have developed our first version of this um, tool, and it identifies and forecasts small drop, freezing drizzle, and freezing rain icing environments, as well as none. And an example of one of the ways this information can be viewed is shown in the graphic on the right-hand side. Um, we are actively evaluating this first version of this tool that we've developed. And last year we did a user demonstration so we could obtain or rather gather uh, some potential users feedback and use that to help guide us on the display and user end of our development. Um, but in that light, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, if uh, this is my last slide here, but if anybody is interested in getting involved in aviation weather research yourself as a user, um, there is an opportunity to do so. I encourage you to contact my colleague, uh, Sonia, who has her um, contact information on this slide. Um, her team does user assessments um, across all of the different aviation weather hazards. It's not just icing. Um, so you could potentially provide feedback on aviation weather products. And if that's an opportunity that you would like to participate in and have an opportunity to participate in, um, then I encourage you to contact her. And with that, I'm gonna pass the baton over. Uh, I think Brad, you're up next. Okay, thanks. All right, well, I'm uh, back with you here. I'm gonna talk about some uh, best practices for winter operations, and I'm gonna focus uh, mainly on storing your aircraft, either for the short term or the long term. If you're gonna store for the long term, uh, anything more than 30 days, I would say read, clean, lube, cover, secure, and check. And when I mean read, check your POH, the flight manual or the engine manual for any uh, uh, winterization procedures that are listed in those. That's the, that's the best place to start for winterizing your aircraft. There's also some good articles out there. You can either Google or uh, the upcoming uh, FAA safety magazine is going to have a good uh, article coming out on putting your aircraft to bed. So it's a good place to start. Uh, clean the airplane. I recommend washing it inside and out. Make sure you remove uh, any gear uh, from the airplane that you need to store elsewhere, especially things that may freeze. Uh, like a soda can. A friend of mine uh, forgot to check his airplane and left a soda can and a sticky exploded soda in the back of your plane is not something that uh, you want to try to clean up. So make sure you clean that kind of stuff out. 
Lubricate the aircraft. Again, per the aircraft and engine manufacturer's recommendation, I use cam guard in my aircraft um, as a preventative uh, for the engine. Uh, cover, if you're outside, uh, this is a picture of my cub here. Uh, <laughs> I've got wing tail, canopy, engine, prop, spinner, pitot tube, all the covers uh, you possibly can have to protect the airplane. If you have the aircraft inside, uh, dust covers are good over the canopy to keep anything from above from falling on it. You want to be careful about uh, covering the windscreen up, though, uh, to avoid any crazing. Uh, don't be uh, moving anything around down there that could cause crazing of your windscreen. Um, if you're outside, make sure the airplane is secure. Good, good ropes, good tie downs. Uh, the aircraft is chalked. You use control locks. Inside, uh, of course, you want to chalk the airplane, and if necessary, use control locks as well, and a good static line. Uh, it's recommended that you close the fuel valves and check uh, that you fill the fuel tanks to prevent any condensation from developing in the tanks. I will say this, though, from my experience, especially with the De Havilland be Beaver, <laughs> we had a beaver that if you filled the beaver up outside in the cold, you know, that cold fuel, and you brought that thing inside the warm hangar and shut the door, uh, there was more than one occasion where you'd come back to the hangar and it'd smell like gas because that fuel, that cold fuel will expand once it's brought inside. And uh, on more than one occasion, we had fuel on the floor. So if you're bringing your airplane in after refueling it with cold fuel into a warm hangar. Be cautious of that. Maybe do not do, don't fill it up all the way. Maybe take it, leave it down just a little bit. Uh, just one thing to think about there. You can also consider uh, adding fuel additives. Again, I would check with the, uh, the POH on that or the engine uh, manufacturer's recommendations for any fuel additives. If your aircraft is stored outside as mine is, you wanna check it. You wanna check it often and always after weather events for security, snow loads, and any potential issues, such as fuel leaks uh, inside the hangar. Of course, uh, you want to block it out for critters, mice, squirrels, etc. They all like to find a really nice place to sleep and find uh, bedding materials, and your aircraft could be their target. Uh, I've, I've heard I've heard horror stories about uh, squirrels in, in seats tearing them up, so uh, be be mindful of that. If you are going to fly your airplane during the winter, like uh, many of us do, where it's, you know, it may be sitting there for weeks on end, but then you need to go out and you want to go out and fly on a nice day, you got to remember to remove all that snow, ice, frost, and covers uh, and control locks. Uh, make sure all that stuff is cleared off the airplane. You want to make sure you preheat the airplane, not just the engine, but, but also the cockpit. And keep in mind that starting a cold engine can do some cost and damage to it. So it's a uh, very good idea to preheat the engine. Uh, I also like to uh, recommend checking your breather tube that you have a backup vent uh, in your breather tube. Uh, gear, you wanna make sure your wheels are still inflated. Of course, as temperatures change, the pressure in your uh, tires can change as well. So you wanna make sure that your gears, or, I'm sorry, your uh, wheels are properly inflated, your skis, if you're on skis like I fly in the winter, that they're properly secure and they're frost free. They don't like to move uh, very well. They have frost in the bottom. And that your uh, brakes are free of snow and ice, including brakes on skis. Uh, I, do, I do have brakes on my, uh, my cub, as you can see there. Um, heat and hazards. It is wintertime, so you're going to be flying with the heat on. Make sure or check to see, do you have a current carbon monoxide detector on board? Uh, it's... It's in good working order. Uh, has your muffler shroud been inspected as required recently? And then when you're out flying, be aware of any signs of potential carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, if you do uh, suspect that you may be uh, being affected by carbon monoxide poisoning, check your CO2 detector. Um, recommend uh, shutting off the heat and venting the cabin and probably landing as soon as practical is a good idea. Uh, you also, when you're doing the walk around, again, check for leaks. Cold weather does funny things to connections. Uh, I, we had a bout of, oh, I think it was around 30 below for a week here last winter. And I went out to check my airplane. Of course, I hadn't been flying. And, and unfortunately, I found this nice blue snow on the tail of it. And uh, by the time I tracked it down, I figured out uh, one of the connections on my, uh, or my rear header tank uh, was leaking. And it was just because it had gotten so cold that 
the connection there the uh, had uh, just uh, contracted enough where it caused a leak. Very simple to fix just by tightening the connection, but uh, those are well, those are good reasons for walking and checking your airplane uh, often. Uh, and let's see, the other thing is avoid the cold rush. You know, there's a tendency when you're pre-flighting outside to hurry, uh, to try to stay warm. I'll just say to, <laughs> if, if hurrying in the cold can also leave you in the, out in the cold, if you miss something, uh, dress for success. Make sure you have plenty of uh, warm clothing on so when you're doing the pre-flight, you don't feel rushed. If you do have to stop and warm up, get in your vehicle or going inside, it's a good idea to mark where you're at on your pre-flight checklist and go back to that point. And I would actually recommend to go back a few steps prior to that uh, so you don't miss anything. Uh, next slide, please. So if you've had your aircraft in storage for a long time, uh, so let's say it's been you know a few months and it's been sitting inside or even outside, I'd say inspect, detect, and correct. Uh, look at the aircraft closely. Uh, use your checklist and a good flashlight. Take your time so you can detect problems that may have occurred during storage. And of course, you want to make sure you correct them all before flying. Look for that. Those uh, unwanted vermin signs, uh, droppings or bedding or anything else that they may have left behind. And if you see any of that stuff, look real closely to see if they caused any damage uh, to your aircraft. Those unwanted tenants uh, do have, do have a, uh, yeah, they have, they've been known to choose wires and things like that. So look really closely if you see any of those signs. And finally, uh, the paperwork. Never forget the paperwork. Uh, you know, if your airplane's been sitting there for a while, make sure it's still an annual, make sure the uh, registration is still valid, ELT is still registered and so on. Um, and that's all I have. I'll turn it on over. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Hey, everybody, uh, real quickly, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm gonna cover a ton of stuff with you. Uh, Going to either have you think about stuff you already know, a refresher, or potentially some new information that you may not have thought about that might be some good ideas for you. So, wilderness survival techniques applies to anything. This survival plan applies to any kind of survival situation, whether it's warm, cold, whatever it may be. The will to live is number one. Uh, we've found people that have su survived relatively healthy and very healthy, plenty of resources around, but they didn't know what to do and they just simply gave up and, and perished from that. Uh, naturally, oxygen, bleeding, first aid is going to be very important. If you're gushing blood and things, that needs to be uh, taken care of. Shelter clothing, especially in the wintertime operations, uh, you may only have about three hours until you're going to be um, a, a popsicle, basically. So uh, you need to take care of shelter. These are a priority from one through eight on how you need to handle a survival situation. Fire, uh, kind of the middle ground there because it does a lot for us. It does our heat. Uh, generating water, signal, just the kumbaya comfort of it is amazing what fire can do. We need to rest. Uh, you don't want to sweat when we're doing a, in a survival situation and expel the what may be the only water we have in us and also burning up calories. We don't want to do that any more than we have to because it may have to carry us for a while. Signals, real important. We need to make sure people know that we're out there and that we want to be found. Uh, water and food come way down on that survival priority list because water, we can go three days without it. May not be uh, thinking real, real, real clearly, but uh, we're going to be okay. Food, we can go up to three weeks. Now, we're going to be very hangry, but that's okay. At least we're still going to be uh, kicking along just fine with that. I um, want to share this example with you. You know, Kind of take a look at what we have here. We have two people out on an ice pack. Uh, don't really have any other resources around. Now, that's not how they started. They actually... Uh, we're ferrying an aircraft across the ice pack to Europe. They had uh, dual engine failures, had to put the aircraft down on the ice pack. As soon as they touched down, the, the aircraft went through the ice um, and, and sank out of sight. Now, all their survival gear was where a lot of us would store their survival gear, behind the seat in the cargo compartments, and they, they were not able to get to it before the aircraft sank out of sight and they lost, except for what was on their back. Uh, I've worked a lot of aircraft accidents, whether it be float planes that sank when they uh, flipped in the water, or uh, conventional aircraft, aircraft that do a force landing and burned up and burned up all the supplies and all the, the you know, the kits and things like that. So uh, something to think about in, in these types of situations is look at the tags on your clothing. Now, again, I flew in Alaska for a lot of years uh, for, for my feet comfort to have, a, to have boots that gave me really good comfort. 
they were almost so big that you know one boot would cover both rudder pedals so you lost your dexterity uh i did find some again there's a there usually is a price tag associated with it but it, like these tags show i found boots that would work just fine they were comfortable i could work the rudder pedals fine but their comfort level was down to a, a minus 100 and so look at your tags very carefully make sure they're water rent, wind resistant and those type of things as you're as you're making your selections the um other things to think about is if you're in an accident situation where you've got to, you know, potentially use the aircraft as fuselage, you can do that on a short-term basis. If you got a blizzard going and it just gets you out of the wind and the, and the, the snow and things, that's fine. Long-term wise, the, the metal fuselage is going to be more, it's going to conduct, because you're you're probably the only heat generator in there anyway, you're going to conduct away all, the, all your heat. So it's not a good idea to use the aircraft fuselage as a shelter. Um, and again, if you if you plan this really well in the in the accident sequence, you probably made half your shelter anyway. These uh, when you knock over trees and things, the the tree balls at the bottom of the trees when you knock these things over, you got half your shelter already built. So and the rest of it's the branches and stuff you knock down anyway. So you've you've done well uh, planning for the survival situation anyway. Uh, also, you're probably not going to fly the airplane back out again. So cannibalize it. Take the headrest. Take the carpets. Make yourself. Take the stuff that you can use to give yourself some barriers between the cold and things like that so that you got yourself some protection. Uh, something else to think about is you, is you you may have passengers with you that you fly all the time or maybe it's the first time, but make sure they know where your equipment's at in the aircraft because you may be incapacitated. They may be the ones that save your life to know where the stuff is at in the aircraft. So make sure you brief them before you take off. Uh, when it comes to signaling, make sure it's big. Uh, the big X, you see the little people standing out there. The white smoke, the white smoke blends into the snow, but the moving shadow is what causes the eye to be attracted to it by the search and rescue. But you've got to make sure that the signals are, are big. Um, it takes an average of about three days, 72 hours for us to find and or get to a wreckage site. That's average. Sometimes they're never found. Sometimes they're found very quickly. So plan your survival kit around a three day being out there. Uh, something I switched over to because, again, because I worked accidents, I saw where survival kits and things were lost in fires and, and sank airplanes and things. I switched over to basically a flying vest. That way, if I get out of the aircraft and basically you can drape it over the back of your seat when you get in, slip it on. The, the aviator ones you can get at Army surplus stores and things or get them online. Fishing vests work just as well. They're comfortable, but I've got all my gear on me. If I get out, my kit gets out with me. So again, something to think about. I, I switched over that way. When it comes to different tools that we may be flying with, um, I again, weapon-wise, there's, there's a lot of survival type gear. I flew or I fly more with the judge on the right-hand side. And the reason for that is I want small package, but I want to have multi-use. With the judge, I've got a, a caliber that I can bring down small game for the food and things like that. I've got shotgun shells, squirrels, birds, uh, protection. But I also can shoot flares in that thing for signaling purposes. So again, a small pistol that has a lot of versatility is kind of the way I went. Again, just something to think about as you're looking at the things you carry with you. Same with tools, like as far as knives. Make sure it's a good quality knife that you can actually split logs with. Test it before you get out there and eat it. If you have a folding knife, make sure it's a lock blade knife. Last thing you want to do is have a have a knife closed on your fingers. You may be perfectly fine, but then you whack your fingers, and, and now you're sitting yourself back in the survival situation. Multi-tools and things, again, great assets. doesn't take up much space, but it has a lot of versatility. Lights, can't talk enough about it. Make sure it's a good LED. I like to be hands-free. I like to have both my hands available to do things while the light's on my head shining down on, on the work area. Uh, I made this available uh, it's one of the downloads you can do. Put together a pink can survival kit. Again, you can use this in your car. You can use it in the airplane. But everything in here will cover two people. Um, and again, it fits really well. It gives you something to cook and carry water with if you need to. So there's a lot of versatility in a small little package. So you know, download that and uh, see if that's something of interest. When you look at your kits, make sure you inspect them every year. If you need to change out your reader glasses and things like that or medications, anything you have in the kit, make sure you get it out. Check it out just like... Brad talked about the airplane. Make sure you're looking at your kit and things of that nature. And again, Ken talked enough about having a good manual in your kit. Don't just wait to use it when you're in a survival situation. Break it out. Know how to use. Look at the techniques. The military ones are pretty good because they're kind of tried and true. But uh, that way you can uh, start using those techniques and learn them before you actually find you have to use them. So that's it. Uh, appreciate the time to, to share this with you. 
And Mike, thank you for that. Uh, as well as Stephanie and Brad, you know, when we talk about from a pilot's perspective, you want to prepare for every eventuality, even the most unfortunate one. And if, in fact, you do end up going down in an austere environment and it's cold, all this stuff that you just briefed will be usually helpful in helping somebody, you know, kind of make the difference between being discovered, being found and uh, and not necessarily faring so well in the cold. So very, very appreciative for that information. And I would like to thank all of our panelists on panel four and all of today's panelists, uh, but in particular panel four for this comprehensive discussion on ice buildup. Uh, it's altitude specific impacts and the invaluable winter survival techniques that I was just talking about before in those emergency situations. All your insights into aircraft maintenance for specifically for Brad during winter and updates on FAA icing research are critical for aviation safety and your expertise is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much to panel four. That is probably the quickest two hours in the history of webinars. Uh, but it is time to bring this particular webinar to a close. Our heartfelt thanks do go out to all of our incredible panelists who have shared their expertise with us today. This journey has been a fantastic opportunity for pilot education, and we're leaving with a wealth of knowledge. Now, in case you missed any part of today's safety education and programming, you can catch the replay on the FAA's YouTube channel. After this webinar, We'll be sharing the list of Zoom attendees with the FAST team so you can earn those one and a half wings credits for your participation. For more information and additional resources, please check out the November-December issue of the FAA Safety Briefing magazine. This issue is all about winter flying safety and promises to be a good one with lots of additional info. You can also visit faa.gov backslash go backslash runway safety. Runway safety is all one word. And if you have any questions or want to share your thoughts on runway safety, you'll find contact information there, or you can also reach out to NATCA at runwaysafety at natca.net. Runwaysafety at natca.net. We hope this webinar equips you for your next journey from the flight deck. Always remember, it's better to know before you go. This has been From the Flight Deck Live, and until next time, fly safe. Thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again.